The Boulder Police Department wrote in a tweet in March of 2021 that when officers formally placed Boulder shooting massacre suspect Ahmad Alisa under arrest at a local hospital, they informed him that the handcuffs used that day were those of Officer Eric Talley. Talley was the first officer to respond to the supermarket where Elisa is accused of shooting to death 10 people, including Talley, who was gunned down when he engaged the suspect. The symbolic gesture of shackling suspected cop killers with cuffs belonging to the slain officer has been made by several police departments across the U.S. in recent years. 23-year-old Chicago police officer John Rivera was shot and killed while off duty in the early morning hours of March 23, 2019. Chicago police say a man named Menelik Jackson fired multiple shots into a car where Rivera sat along with three others, killing Rivera and injuring another person. The assault was the result of a case of mistaken identity. Jackson and another man had gotten into a fight earlier in the night with a group of Hispanic men. Then they went out searching for the men and instead encountered Rivera and his friends. After Jackson was taken into custody, Rivera's mother delivered the fallen officer's cuffs to area central headquarters and the restraints were used to transport Jackson from the interview room to the lockup. During the summer of 2018 in Weymouth, Massachusetts, a suburb of Boston, about 15 miles south of the city, as 41-year-old city police officer Michael Chesna was nearing the end of his midnight to 8 a.m. shift, he was dispatched to help search for a man who had fled the scene of an accident on foot. According to authorities, Chesna found a man named Emmanuel Lopes in the backyard of a home near a local hospital and attempted to apprehend him. In the confrontation, Lopes took Chesna's gun and proceeded to shoot the six-year veteran of the department several times before again fleeing on foot. Chesna suffered bullet wounds to the head, chest, and legs and was pronounced dead at South Shore Hospital shortly before 8 a.m. Lopes himself was shot in the leg by an officer before he was apprehended. He was also taken to South Shore Hospital for treatment, and when he was restrained in his hospital bed, Weymouth police used Chesna's handcuffs. In September of 2014, Corporal Brian Dickinson was killed in an ambush at the state police barracks in the small township of Bloomington Grove, Pennsylvania, about 15 miles from the New York border. 48 days later, police captured a man named Eric Freen, who they believed was Dickinson's killer. Dickinson's cuffs had been set aside for the occasion. A sergeant who had worked with Dickinson used the trooper's patrol car to deliver the handcuffs to the arrest scene 30 miles away in Tannersville. Police say he then used the cuffs to shackle the man. On January 9th of 2017, police sergeant Deborah Clayton was shot to death outside of Walmart in Orlando, Florida. She was attempting to apprehend murder suspect Markeith Lloyd, who had been on the run since shooting and killing his pregnant former girlfriend, Sade Dixon, a few weeks prior. Sade's older brother, Ronald Stewart, was also shot in the incident, but survived several bullet wounds. Markeith Lloyd admits to shooting both his ex-girlfriend and her brother, but says he did so in self-defense. Lloyd was apprehended on January 17th, and a pair of cuffs that belonged to Clayton were clasped upon his wrists. These were presumably the restraints holding Lloyd's hands behind his back as he sat in a police interview room later, badly beaten, and complaining that the cuffs were too tight. Following is a narrative of the events that unfolded in the preceding weeks and eventuated in this scene. This man, he just can't stay out of trouble. Why you can't stay out of trouble? I repeat, I ain't did shit. <laughs> <laughs> Driving a little fast. A little. <laughs> <laughs> you can't take him, officer. You can't take him. You gotta take her too. <laughs> <laughs> these will be together in booking. I gotta buy my baby a jet or something. He do not like the way at these. Like he don't like the way that the lights. He don't like to stop at stop signs. He be going around traffic. This man, he has to be stopped. 
He, she didn't just stop. Got, <laughs> <laughs> but no, you need a greater force than that. He has to be stopped. Somebody hit, stop him. He has to be stopped. This is ridiculous. I'm not going to live past 25. I'm not going to make it. Not like this. 40 year old Markeith Lloyd connected with 24 year old Sade Dixon via Facebook in the waning days of summer 2016. When he went on trial for her murder in the fall of 2019, he testified in his own defense and described their meeting. He was asked by his lawyer, How did you meet Sade? Uh, from Facebook. She sent me a friend request. So I see, I, I like a couple of pictures for all my female friends. I like a couple of pictures. So with Sade, I liked a couple of pictures of her. She had kids, I liked a couple of pictures of her kids. And I, I went on Facebook. So as soon as I went on Facebook, she jumped in my inbox. Marquis testified that he was looking to build a relationship and wasn't simply interested in sex. He continued exchanging direct messages with Sade via Facebook and they eventually exchanged numbers. Soon after, they met up for the first time. September the 16th, that's the first day I went, and, I went and picked her up. We went out, we hung out. So she stayed the night, she stayed the night with me. So we, we sleep in the same bed, but I don't try to have sex with her. So I, I waited the next day, we got up, we showered. So I pulled out a condom and then she was like, don't use, don't use it. So I'm like, hold up. I said, don't use it. I'm like, you must have to commit yourself to me because I don't just have unprotected sex with anybody. Like, if I have unprotected sex, I'm considered you my wife, and that's what I believe. So I'm like, you must have to commit to me. And then she was like, she was like, yeah, don't use it. So I, I didn't use it. We had unprotected sex. Sade more or less moved in right away. She started basically staying with me off, from, off rip. So from, from that point on, she, she kind of moved in with you? Yes, she was bringing stuff in slowly. But her mother, who also testified at trial, disapproved of the relationship from the start, as Markeith explained. She was, she, was, she, was neg she was negative, she was disrespectful, but I always respected her. When Sade's mother, Mrs. Stephanie Dixon Daniels, took the stand, she was asked by the prosecution how she felt about Markeith dating her daughter. Would you form an opinion as to whether or not you approved the relationship between your daughter and the defendant? No, I never approved the relationship from the get-go. Did you make it known to him that you did not approve the relationship with your daughter? I think he kind of knew from the first encounter. During defense counsel's cross-examination of Mrs. Dixon Daniels, Marquise lawyer Terry Lineman asked her for more details about her feelings toward Marquise in the beginning. You didn't like Marquis. No, I did not. And you thought he was too old for your daughter. Is that right? That is correct. And that left a really bad taste in your mouth. The age difference. Of course it does. As a matter of fact, you said some things to him about that. I did. And can you tell me what those were? I called him a 40-year-old nigger. Uh, anything else? Pedophile. About two weeks after Markeith and Sade met, she told him that her period was late. Comes October, she, October, comes October the 1st, she was like, I didn't have my period this month. So I'm like, well, when do you usually have your period? When they brought a pregnancy test, we took a pregnancy test, it came back negative. So we ended up waiting like a week and took another one, and then it came back positive that she was pregnant. Markeith was suspicious that he might not be the man that made Sade pregnant. I already knew. I feel like she was pregnant before I got with her. And how'd you feel about that? I didn't care, I wanted the baby. Oh. And I, I, I wanted the baby. I'm a convicted felon. I, I, I can't go adopt one. I wanted to raise a child. Markeith Lloyd testified for several hours over the course of two days. He discusses having been incarcerated four times. He explains to the jury that the police have been trying to kill him all his life 
that he was innocent of the drug crime of which he was convicted, earning him a 12 and a half year sentence. He admitted that he assaulted a police officer as a young man and explained how he was justified in doing so. He spent an additional four years in prison for that conviction. He described getting himself back on his feet after being released from prison in 2014. He tells the jury that he's a hardworking man holding down multiple jobs as a delivery driver and sometimes running the cash register at the takeout place where he was employed and working security at a strip club, among other side gigs. He moved from a halfway house into a multi-bedroom home that he rented and subletted to friends and family. He recalls being robbed on multiple occasions while delivering food in the wee hours of the morning in some of the roughest parts of Orlando, as he regularly did. So the second time I got called to the Pine Hills area, I'm sitting in the car. I'm not even paying attention because I'm on the phone with Shadi. So I'm talking to Shadi on the phone, and then there's another jet. He come around the back of the house, and he got a gun. So they run up to the car, put the gun in the door. They're like, give us the money. So I, I park the car. I get out the car. I'm like, I'm like, what? I'm like, what's up, jet? They taking the stuff out the car. I'm finna try to. Walk up, walk up, uh, and get it, and, and take this gun from him. But the other, the other, the other jet, he see what's going on. He was like, "Don't try to grab the gun. Don't try to grab that gun." And he, he bad back. They were like, "Give us, give us the money. Give us the money." So, I gave him the money that I had in my pocket. Sade contacted Texas Chicken, where Markeith worked, alerted them of the robbery, and got the address where Markeith was making the delivery. She also called the police. Then she grabbed one of Markeith's guns and rode with Marquis's brother and another man to the crime scene. And did she come to the scene? Yes, she came to the scene. All right. Did she have anything with her? She, no, she told me that she left it in the car with Glenn and my brother. I'm like, I'm like, why would you bring a gun? You know, the, the, you call the police. So she told you she had a gun in the car? Yes. Did you ever see it? Yes. Okay. Whose gun was it? It was mine. Okay. This second robbery was what motivated Marquis to start carrying multiple guns while making deliveries. Which is why he would explain, he had two pistols with him on the fateful night of December 13th. In much of his testimony, he portrays himself as a victim. He describes himself being blackmailed by ex-girlfriends. He discusses how Sade played on his emotions. Based on his testimony, he is a benevolent sponsor who pays for Sade's real estate school tuition and supports struggling friends and family by paying bills for them. He's a ladies man. He doesn't have to look for sex. Sex comes easy. It's clear that Marquis thinks quite a bit of himself. You can hear the satisfaction in his voice as he shares his wisdom with the jury. He portrays himself as a man of God, though he shuns organized religion. He shares his insights about life and at times appears to be preaching. He sees himself as a martyr, a Christ figure, and a prophet. He describes to the jury signs from God he's received. According to him, one of his bosses asked him to borrow some money one day. Marquis drove home to get the cash for his boss where Sade was hanging out alone, studying for her real estate exam. She hadn't been expecting Marquis to come home. So he asked me to borrow $600 at the time. So I'm like, all right. I got to go to the house and get it because I ain't got the number because I stopped carrying money because I had to be getting robbed. So when I go to the house, I open the door. It's a, it's a pretty scene. She on the bed. She got the plaque, what you call them, screen cards, flash cards. I'm, I'm like, all right. But then I look, I see a big ham sandwich on the bed. I'm like, what that is? Basically, I was telling you, you got to sneak and do stuff around me. Go go be with who you want to be so you can be happy. If I don't make you happy, like me. I went back to work. My boss was like, he was like, I don't even need the money. I got the money right here. Somebody came to pay, they, somebody came to pay their rent. I'm like, I'm wondering, did God send me home to catch you eating meat? Because now I come to find out my boss don't even need, my boss don't even need the money. So you thought that was a sign from God? Y yes, sir. And that was something that happened on a regular basis, these signs of God? Yes, sir. Marquis said to the jury that he doesn't eat meat because he doesn't believe in taking the lives of God's creations. He doesn't do drugs of any kind. Sade, however, enjoyed smoking marijuana. Marquis didn't have a problem with that, but with the fact that she smoked weed while pregnant. He was concerned, he said, about the baby's development. 
But his biggest gripe with Sade, he said, was that she lied to him frequently. It, it wasn't the fact that she's smoking and eating meat and doing, it's, it's the fact that she's lying. Markeith claimed that the one time he was physically violent towards Sade was one day early on in the relationship. The altercation, as he called it, was the result of a lie that she had told him. In the beginning of our relationship, she went somewhere one time. So she came back, I'm like, I'm like, where you was? She's like, I was at my cousin house. But I, I knew she was lying. So I go back home, I'm like, why you, I'm like, why you lying? You went at your cousin, I, I just went right there and asked her. But she just kept on lying. So I grabbed, so I grabbed the body, I grabbed the body neck and then I pushed her down. So now by me, by me trespassing on her, my hair, I had dreads that came way past my waist. So I had long hair. I, I love my hair. So by me trespassing on her, I felt like I had, I had to give something. I had to give her up or I had to give up. I had to give up. I had to give up something. So I cut my hair off. Markeith seems to be living out multiple biblical references here. He cuts his hair and relinquishes his beloved locks because of a woman, Sade, as Samson did in the Bible, albeit in a different way. And to cut his hair over his transgression against Sade is an extreme show of repentance, which is a common religious theme. But as Marquise preaches to the jury about atoning for one's trespasses and honesty in relationships, he describes his approach to settling conflicts with Sade, which often involves passive-aggressive fuckery, head games, and manipulation. He sneaks out to have sex with his ex-girlfriend Jamie Slaughter because he's suspicious that Sade might be out creeping as well. Then he explains to the jury his ludicrous plan to give Sade six months to get her act together. And if she didn't, he would somehow take custody of Sade's newborn child and raise it with Jamie Slaughter. She got six months to get her stuff together. If she don't have stuff together in six months, I'm gonna leave her. Me and you go get back together. And me and you go raise the baby. One of the things I don't understand is why would Markeith choose as the new mother of his child, a woman who he admitted on the stand has serious mental health issues. At the time, Jimmy Slaughter was receiving disability benefits and was unable to support herself all of which makes his plan all the more preposterous. When December of 2016 came, Sade and Markeith were still together, but tensions were still high. Then on the 10th, Markeith caught Sade in a lie about whether she'd been out smoking weed with her friends, which she had, according to him. He decided to break up with her. He gave her the news then went to work that evening. That night he texted back and forth with her about the issues they were having. The next day he helped her pack her things and took her and her two boys back to her family home. Over the course of the next two days, they argued over the phone and via text sporadically. They hung up on one another, called one another back, hung up again. At one point or another, each refused the other's calls or ignored the other's texts. As Marquis began to appreciate the prospect of Sade having an abortion, now that they were apart, he realized he had overreacted. Now, are you trying to call her and she's not answering? Yes. Okay. And so what do you want to talk to her about? Just, I want to talk to her and, and, and see where she really stand there because I'm thinking more about this baby. I put, uh, if, if you really done, just let me know and I can, I can deal with that. But I really love you and just need to know where you really stand. He called Sade and texted her, but she didn't respond. At the same time, Markeith was spreading his wings and reaching out to ex-girlfriends and other women who'd messaged him on Facebook. I said, I said, me and you used to kick it. The question, your, your sister used to mess with Odell. Then she put, but I seen you in a relationship and respect is all I have for that. But I see you on your fitness, me too. You probably can help me, you probably can help me with, with some things. I put me and her not together at this time. Me and her not together at this moment. Cause me and her not together at this moment because we wouldn't even be having this conversation, laugh out loud, and yeah, I, I can work you out. You ready now? Sade got wind of Marquis's conversations with these women. She had access to his Facebook. Marquis tells the jury that he logged Sade out of his Facebook account after the breakup and was unaware that she had his password. In my opinion, he likely knew that she still had access to the account and wanted Sade to be aware that he was moving on quickly 
but chose to let her know in this backhanded way. More passive aggressive gamesmanship. On Tuesday, December 13th, Sade finally responded to Mark Keith. After she shows you, or she sends you that stuff that was from your Facebook, she mm -hmm. sends you, you these texts. I would never disrespect you by talking to nobody after breaking up with you for a day. And then you had the audacity to chill with the bitch for her birthday and put her on your Facebook. It ain't even been a week and you fucking around. Been around your ex and some mo shit. Just don't feel no type of way when I'm fucking. You showed me what I needed to see. You ain't shit fuck nigga. Talking about you want a family, but you a man of God. Fuck out of here. At 8.05 that evening, she texted him. Right here is on the 13th. Right, so her response is on the 13th. Yes. At 8.05 p.m. the yes. next night. Yes. And she said, this is literally like 50 minutes before, or 40 minutes before you head over to the house. And she says, I'm glad you all had fun out to eat. Now I know, don't expect no baby. Yes. And what is she, what are you thinking now when she's saying, don't expect no baby? That either she go do something the kid or baby will get an abortion? Just before 9 p.m., Markeith Lloyd drove to Sade's family home to explain himself, to smooth things out with her and convince her not to have an abortion. He happened to be armed with not one, but two handguns. Markeith went up to the home, peeked inside a window, and saw Sade's older brother, Ronald Stewart, who would later testify against him at trial. Markeith may or may not have been aware at the moment that Sade's parents and children were present somewhere inside the home. Her younger brother, Dominique Daniels, who also testified at trial, would arrive home during Markeith's visit as well. Markeith got Ron's attention and motioned for him to come to the front door, Ron told Sade that Markeith was there and she went outside to talk to her now ex-boyfriend. Markeith admitted to Sade that he had had sex with another woman that day, which intensified the dialogue. Sade told Markeith to wait there. She went inside, came back, and invited Markeith over to the side of the house near the garage. Once there, she pulled a pistol on him, at which time Markeith pulled his pistols, ordering Sade to drop the gun. She did so and Marquis took possession of it. The former couple continued arguing. At some point, Ron came outside to check on his sister. As the three of them stood in front of the home, Ron encouraged the pair to call it a night, calm themselves and continue their conversation at another time. At one point, Sade became enraged when Marquis, knowing that Sade is an intensely private person, informed Ron that Sade has been smoking weed while pregnant and fucking around with other dudes. At another point, Sade told Marquis that her brother could kick his ass. The situation continued to escalate. She informed Ron that Marquis had just pulled a gun on her. Soon after, according to Marquis, is when Ron attacked him and tried to disarm him. There was a scuffle, and at the same time, Marquis realized that he was no longer in possession of Sade's gun. In the confusion that lasted a matter of seconds, Markeith fired one of his guns several times, believing, he said, that Sade may have rearmed herself. He then got back into his vehicle and fled the scene, certain that he had just shot his ex and her brother, but not knowing what condition they were in. Bullets struck Sade's torso, both arms, left lower extremity, and right foot. She was pronounced dead later at Orlando Regional Medical Center. Ronald Stewart was critically injured. He was shot twice in the leg and once in the chest. He survived and spent a month in the hospital. Start hearing my mom saying, my babies, my babies, my babies. He shot my babies. There are differences between Ron's version of that night's events and Marquise. Most notably, Ron testified that he did not attack Marquise and there was no struggle for a gun. According to Ron, Sade was running away and trying to get into the house when Markeith shot her. 
Ron claimed that he had his hands raised and was attempting to de-escalate the situation when Markeith fired at him and his sister. Did you tell the jury what you saw when you opened the door? I saw my daughter on my right hand side laying, bleeding to death, and I saw my son laying on a rock part or lead spread on the porch. And they were they were both down and they were bleeding. And I'm screaming to the top of my lungs that my baby was shot. Everything everything happened like this and, and once once Ron attacked me, he turned my mind into something else. He turned my mind into something. He attacked me. I, I didn't I didn't do nothing for him to attack me. I didn't do nothing for him to get no, get no gun. And once he attacked me, he turned my mind into something else. And I was just reacting, Mary. I was just reacting. Even when they opened the door, I just reacted. I just reacted. I fired two shots. I just reacted. He had my mind somewhere else. I never meant for this to happen. I wanted my child. I'm not going to kill my sister. I'm not going to kill my queen. I wanted my child. I didn't want that. I never wanted that. Responding officers discovered Sade's 9mm pistol on the lawn of the Dixon residence, but it had not been fired. Markeith Lloyd went into hiding. He said that during that time he was, quote, everywhere, on a bike, sleeping on bus stop benches. His niece, Lakentia Smith Lloyd, another ex-girlfriend, Jamie Slaughter, and his former employer, Zargi Mayan, were accused of providing Lloyd assistance while he was in hiding. Orange County prosecutors charged all three with aiding and abetting first-degree murder. Christmas came and went. 2016 became 2017. On January 9th, Surveillance cameras captured Markeith Lloyd walking into this Walmart Supercenter on Princeton Street at about 6.45 a.m. wearing camouflage pants and a shirt with the word security printed on it. Beneath that, he wore a bulletproof vest. At exactly 7 a.m., Sergeant Deborah Clayton walked into the store wearing her police uniform. Her shift was about to start and she'd made a stop on her way to work. A minute later, you see her grab a cart and walk into the Walmart at 7 a.m. on the dot. She heads to the produce aisle first, is there for a few minutes, while Markeith Lloyd is seen coming out of the bathroom at 7.04. For the next 10 minutes or so, the two are seen shopping, crossing paths every few minutes. This is Lieutenant Clayton walking past the cosmetic line at 7.09 a.m. Three minutes later, you see Lloyd walk by too. By now, Lieutenant Clayton was checking out, while Lloyd, who was in the same line as Clayton, decides to check out on the other side of the store. It was while he was in line to check out there, the most chilling moment occurred at 7.15 a.m. Watch closely as Lieutenant Clayton, on the way out of the Walmart and to work, walks right past Lloyd, checking out. Having no idea, less than three minutes later, she would be dead. A woman who happened to be in the store, who knew Markeith and knew he was wanted for murder, walked up to Clayton and informed her that Markeith was there going through the checkout line. Deborah Clayton radioed for backup at 7.17 a.m. She said, quote, I guess we're looking for Markeith. He's walking out the door now. I guess he was involved in a shooting with a pregnant female. I'm at the first entrance, unquote. She confronted Markeith in the parking lot. Surveillance video of what happened outside the store has not been released to the public. According to a warrant that was issued for Lloyd's arrest, Sergeant Clayton ran approximately 10 feet behind Lloyd as he ran between two concrete pillars. Lloyd looped around one of the pillars, drew his gun and pointed at Clayton. Clayton pulled out her gun and turned to run toward the parking lot when Lloyd fired three rounds at her according to police. One of the bullets hit Clayton in her right hip, causing her to fall on the ground and hit her face on the pavement. The other two bullets struck vehicles that were parked nearby. Still lying on the ground with no way to take cover, the officer rolled onto her back and aimed at Lloyd, the report said. The suspect walked towards Clayton and fired several shots. Clayton fired at him several times. Lloyd ran counterclockwise around Clayton, took aim toward her head and fired several more rounds. 
The exchange of gunfire lasted six seconds. A total of 16 shots were fired. Sergeant Clayton was struck four times. One bullet in the hip, another going through her buttock and shattering her hip bone, one in the thigh and one going through her neck and lodging in her shoulder. She was pronounced dead at Orlando Regional Medical Center at 7.40 that morning. Among witnesses who told police accounts of what happened in the Walmart parking lot that morning was Monica Pridgen, an employee at the Princeton Street Walmart at the time. She had just clocked out for the day and was sitting in her car in the parking lot warming up the engine when... And that's when I seen Officer Deborah come out to her truck. She parks right in front of the store. And I was just sitting there and I saw a chick walk up to her. And I physically heard her tell her, the dude that killed that pregnant girl is right there in the store. He's getting ready to come out. And Miss Deborah, as she's walking towards the store, that's when I heard her say, hey, you. And to me, all hell broke loose. And I stood up, that's when I stood up when I heard her say, hey, you. And I literally watched Marquise Lloyd. All I seen was him run around the post and I seen him pull his gun out and they were shooting at each other like a Western movie. Miss Deborah, I want to say, let off about six to seven shots. I don't know exactly. It was crazy that morning. And Mr. Marquise pretty much was trying to unload his gun on her. He was really trying to get rid of her. Like it was something personal. And then all of a sudden I see Miss Deborah fall. And I guess that's when she must have called. I got shot or something on her radio or her walkie talkie. She was on her back. And as I got ready to run over there, Marquis Lloyd just kept shooting at this lady while she's on the ground. So I'm looking at her body literally jumping off the ground from bullets, of course. He's unloading, he's, he shot at her at least five or six more times as she's on the ground. Clayton's backup arrived less than one minute later. A witness is pointed at a dark green Mercury that was pulling out of the parking lot and said that the suspect was behind the wheel. Marquis escaped and drove to Royal Oak Apartments, according to police. They said Marquis fired two shots at an Orange County Sheriff's deputy approaching in an unmarked car. He then carjacked a man at gunpoint and drove the victim's 2013 Volkswagen Passat through a fence. The Volkswagen was found unoccupied at Brookside Apartments. Lloyd's discarded security shirt and camouflage pants were located on a nearby back porch. A hole in the shirt indicated that he had been shot in the chest during the exchange with Sergeant Clayton, but the bulletproof vest prevented him from being injured. Orlando police placed the area on lockdown. Dozens of schools locked down, SWAT teams swarming an apartment complex going door to door looking for Lloyd. Two deputies searching for the shooter in motorcycle crashes. One deputy, Norm Lewis, known as a gentle giant, was killed. The 41-year-old, already a wanted man, his pregnant girlfriend shot at her front door last month, a warrant issued for his arrest. Investigators scouring Lloyd's Facebook page for clues. Lloyd posting this two weeks ago goals to be on America's Most Wanted. After hours of searching door to door for Lloyd, it was determined that he had again successfully evaded capture. He fled to Volusia County after the killing of Sergeant Clayton and remained there for the next several days. On January 17th, authorities tracked Mark Keith to an abandoned house at 1157 Lescott Lane. The house was in the Carver Shores neighborhood where Mark Keith grew up. Police surrounded the house and ordered him to surrender. Marquis dropped his two guns out the bedroom window and crawled from the home out onto the lawn. This night vision footage captures some of the arrest. It shows the moment officers swarmed Mr. Lloyd and when one officer kicks him in the head and his body goes limp. At least one more officer kicks Marquis in the head before the camera pans away. When Lloyd is brought out of a police cruiser at an Orlando police precinct before news cameras, he yells, They beat me up! They beat me up! Inside, he was interviewed by detectives for 45 minutes. During the interrogation, he repeatedly asked for medical attention. He complains that his cuffs are too tight as blood drips from his face onto the tabletop before him. As detectives tried to elicit information from Mark Keith about the killings he suspected of committing, they mock and berate the man and ignore his evident suffering. Lloyd suffered numerous serious injuries during his arrest, including a fractured jaw and a broken eye socket for which he required surgery. He would lose his left eye as a result of the assault. On January 10th, he made his first court appearance. 
or they done took my eye. They done broke my nose, broke my jaw. They did all this shit till I resisted, but I crawled out to the motherfucking road. So how did I resist? They ain't resist shit. They just did that shit. They tried to hide it from the news people, but I'm here right um, now. Corrections, I think we've we've established everything we need to do in a first appearance hearing. He can be taken after he signs. Baby, fuck you. Have him this was only one of many tongue lashings with which Markeith would bless the court. His courtroom outbursts would be viewed millions of times online in the months leading up to his trial. Markeith Lloyd's trial for the murder of Sade Dixon began in September of 2019, 32 months after his capture. On Wednesday, October 16th, he was convicted of first degree murder, but was later spared the death penalty. The abandoned house on the Scott Lane where authorities captured Mark Keith was again made infamous in September of 2017, just 10 months after police captured Mark Keith there. A six month old infant was discovered in the house after her mother called police about the missing child. The child's father would later admit to having punched the child, causing her fatal injuries. The aiding and abetting charges against Lakentia Smith Lloyd, Jamie Slaughter, and Zargi Mayan were eventually dropped. The state of Florida launched an investigation into the use of force during Markeith Lloyd's capture. Some investigators and officers on the scene did take issue with how the arrest was handled. Florida Department of Law Enforcement Special Agent Jeffrey Duncan said he saw numerous officers dogpile on Lloyd after he crawled to the street, adding he saw Lloyd's head get stomped. Orange County Sheriff Sergeant Bruce Vail described officers screaming and yelling at Lloyd and taking out frustrations in what he described as a bit of a mob scene. However, the investigation found that the arresting officer's conduct on January 17th was appropriate and justified. During her funeral service at First Baptist Orlando on Saturday, January 14, 2017, Master Sergeant Deborah Clayton was posthumously promoted to the rank of Lieutenant. On October 8th of 2021, Markeith Lloyd will stand trial for the murder of Deborah Clayton. If found guilty, he may be sentenced to death.